Without further ado, I would like to turn the discussion to Julie. First, I want to ask you, Julie, about the book, obviously, that is the reason why we all gathered today here. When is the sort of publishing, creating the book came to your mind? Uh, what Jania had just actually talked about, which was uh, to remember uh, our stories, remember the, the journey that we've all gone on, uh, was really important for me to tell the story. And it became a very natural medium for me to do it through food and, of course, through the product that my family became known for, which is kefir. And, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I share a story of a time when I visited Israel during the Holocaust Memorial Day. And there was a big remembrance, and it happened to also be Shabbat. And I visited uh, a chef's home. We had dinner in his home. And he, his Kaddish cup, his, his Kiddish cup, he um, told me a story about the fact that when his family was being deported into the concentration camps, they took this Kaddish cup. It was the only thing that they were able to take with them. It was his great grandfather's grandfather's Kiddush cup. And this chef was already like 80 years old. So this Kiddush cup was old. <laughs> and they took it to the camp. And every Friday on Shabbat, they passed the Kaddish cup around the concentration camp. They didn't have wine. They didn't have bread. But they passed it around. And it was a spiritual resistance for them that somehow, even in the most devastating moments, they found some sort of spirituality, that they found some sort of strength to manage to get, you know, to handle it. And he survived and he had his cup and we drank out of it on, on that day. And it became the sort of inspiration for Baba Ganush story, uh, recipe with the story. And so, you know, it was these kind of stories that I wanted to bring to light. I wanted to tell the story of you know, refugees and of myself, of us, many in the room, of, of immigrants. I wanted to tell the story of women entrepreneurship and, and all these other stories. But so so that that's what kind of was the inspiration and goal. Just getting back into the publishing piece of it, um, I wanted to write a book. I didn't know what that was going to look like. Uh, my friend had written a book, and so she passed along her agent to me. So I met with her agent in New York. I told her my story. I told her the history of the company, my own personal story. Uh, and she said, Let, you know, OK, here, you actually have at least three books in you. <laughs> she said, there's at least three. There's a memoir. There's a potential like business how-to kind of book. And then there's a cookbook. And you have to do the cookbook first, because this is the hottest food trend happening in the country and maybe in the world, probiotics, kefir, superfoods. And you, your family, have brought this product to the mainstream. You, you own this category. You have to write the book. And if you don't, somebody else will. And you'll be very mad. So you should do the book. You should do the kefir cookbook. And so I said, OK, great. That's what we're going to do first. So I start. Then you, so we signed on agreement. So there was some time there. This is the tip. If you want to write a book, this is what you do. You get your agent. Uh, then the eight, you write a proposal. And a proposal is like, a, it's almost like a business plan. Like, here's what I'm going to do. You don't start writing a book. You write a proposal first. Here's who I am. Here is my network. Here is my, uh, you know, my pro whatever your story is, whatever it is. You tell it, lay it out in your proposal. That took me two years to do. Because <laughs> I, I have other things happening, too. So I wasn't in a rush to do it, in, in a big rush. I was, you know, I wanted to do it, but I wasn't, like, putting too much pressure on myself. And I had to take a pause for a few other things that were happening. And so I wrote the proposal. And then the, the agent goes and pitches the proposal all within two weeks. They hit all of the publishing houses. So we picked a few that made sense, whether they were recipe cookbook, you know, publishers specialized in or health or wellness or whatever. And and then and the first one that I wanted was Harper's because they had already published some of my most favorite books, some of my favorite admired authors came out of Harper Collins. So they were on my first list and they were the first appointment that I had and I was like not even hiding the fact that I wanted them to be the ones that published me, even though other ones came out. Um, and they they 
immediately that day came through with an offer. By the, but before I got back to Chicago, they had already made an offer to buy the book. So then they bought the book and they write in advance to, for me to be able to go and produce it. So imagine I'm like the producer of the book, basically. So then there's cameramen, there's photographers, food stylists, all this other stuff that goes into it. It's like three parts. Then it's writing, photography, and recipe development. So there's like having three books actually. So then, you know, I had a, a I knew, for example, the recipes. You know, I grew up making the salad de Livia, but I didn't write it out, for example. So it was a different process in like figuring out how to write it in a way that is uh, easy instructions and then testing all of it, making sure that the recipes work. So I tasted the pizza, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> um, so yeah, all the recipes that are out here today came from the book. So that's kind of the publishing world. And yeah, I, that, that was the, did, did that answer all the, I think it did. How long did it actually take you to write the actual book? Yeah, so after the business, as after the proposal, it took about another two years to write the book. So that wasn't that much longer than, then it kind of came, you know, it was quick. And uh, I turned in the manuscript in April last year so April, and then it's been, you know, in, it was in editing and everything else. I, I turned in photography, everything turned in April, and then we edited it, and then it released last month. It takes a long time. It's like a long pregnancy. <laughs> well, you mentioned already HarperCollins, one of the biggest publishing houses in the United States. Um, tell a little bit about the process of you interviewing with them, and uh, what did Julius Malansky said to convince HarperCollins to take on the book? Well, I'm very passionate, so I think most of the time people can sense the passion. Um, you know, it was actually a very easy sell because I talked about how, um, of course, the trends in healthy eating, how the desires for healthy eating, uh, how we're all looking to incorporate healthier foods. The fact that today consumers are really looking for stories about their ingredients, especially stories um, with this product, which is 2,000 years old, that has so much history, so much stories around it. I mean, it was written about in the Bible. Marco Polo wrote about it in his travels. Genghis Khan wrote about it. Cleopatra bathed in it. I mean, it, there was a, a, a war started almost over these kefir grains, and a princess was kidnapped. It was a botched kidnapping. And a, I mean, these stories are very rich, and, and so uh, the publishers understand that. They know that consumers today, they want to know about their, their, their food, where it comes from, the history. Um, everyday chefs at home want to do kind of, they're called DIYs, do-it-yourself do projects. They want to post something on Instagram and feel that they discovered something before anyone else discovered it. And so using something unique, like you're not gonna be like, oh, I made the salad with lettuce. No one cares, like, welcome to the world. But if you said, I made the salad and I use this kefir, this, it's got probiotics, it's a 2,000 year old product, you know, it's good for your gut, and whatever, yada, yada, you start talking about this unknown product, now you have an interesting salad. So they understand this, we know this in, in the industry. And of course, uh, another part of selling a book, anybody can write a book, I mean, not anybody, it's actually really, really hard to do, um, a lot harder than I thought, um, but, the thing is that there's many talented writers. This book isn't a Pulitzer Prize winning book by any means, but uh, what they also look for in taking an author is that you have a platform. And I've already built out a platform. So it's very important if you're considering doing it to have a following of some sort, You know, have a, a network, have a social media platform. Like today publishers want to see a certain number of followers on your social media. Um, so my own personal one. Um, so you have to build out a, a personal brand. Um, they were aware that I had already been media trained, that I you know, do panels that I'm comfortable in front of. Once you write the book, then you have to promote the book. <laughs> you have to do stuff like this. Um, so did I have the capability of that? You know, I had, of course, the company behind me, which is another great asset. So I really leveraged a lot of the um, elements that I had working to my advantage. So those are things you need to do. Do you have your favorite recipe, and how were you choosing recipes for the book? Yeah, I mean, it's so hard for me to pick my favorite because they're all so good, um, and I have made them all. They're delicious. Um, I 
it's really, really hard for me to pick a favorite. Uh, I love all of the ones that, of course, are Russian because they're my Russian history. They're my memories from childhood. Um, the stories that I've associated with them are very special to me. Um, like, I love borscht. I love my mom's borscht, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, so I, I have her recipe in there. Um, but I also love some of this, the recipes around, like, the stories, like um, the Chicago scramble, for example. It's like, you know, an omelet, it's scrambled eggs with sausage. And it, was rem it reminded me of when my mom had her deli. Maybe some of you had been to her deli on Devon at Globus. Many people had gone through that store when they came to America or had immigrated. They had gone to Globus like within the first few hours of landing in in Chicago, and uh, you know I didn't have a typical childhood. My parents were you know these hard. I mean, many of our parents were hardworking immigrants just starting out. My mom needed to buy sausage for the deli. You know her inventory so instead of you know just being home or playing after school at home we would go to down 94 and you know the heat hot summer days you know Huey Lewis would be playing on the on the radio 80s soundtrack and no air conditioning and we'd get to Ashland sausage I don't even know if it's still there but Ashland sausage and she would the, they would load up her trunk with sausages and the owner would talk to me and give me a, a, my own little sausage and I drive home snacking on the sausage and we'd deliver it to her deli and I just it, the car you know he'd sit the car like immediately sunk because there's so much sausage in the back <laughs> like driving along 94 back to the deli and on Sunday mornings um, my it was the one thing my dad could cook was scrambled eggs with he pour kefir into it into the scrambled eggs and cut up all the sausage that was in the house and I combined I wanted to share the idea of like immigrants and all the immigrants that come to our city and so there's we use like I use Italian sausage Polish sausage Spanish sausage sausage to really reflect on our melting pot in our country that when we come here then we're all Americans and so I tell that story. So that's really favorite. But I love like all the healthy ones too. You know, so, um, I love like um, that. There's like an apricot chia, white chocolate apricot chia that my friend Katrina contributed. For um, uh, she's the founder of Vos Chocolate, the very fancy truffle company. So she gave me her favorite recipe that she makes with our product and her products together. So chocolate and kefir. And uh, there was another great recipe submitted by um, Christy Turlington, who's a supermodel. I think many of us know Christy Turlington. She's a friend of mine. She uh, submitted a smoothie, a running smoothie. So we started a marathon group to raise awareness around maternal health. And we've traveled around the world supporting you know, maternal health. And so started this marathon group. So she gave, uh, she contributed a smoothie that she makes after her runs or before her runs. And uh, it's a healthy green spinach smoothie. Uh, so I have a supermodel in there too. <laughs> so it's really very eclectic, unexpected, diverse. There's a, a cricket smoothie. I actually take cricket flour and we make a smoothie with it. And this is a, a unique sustained protein source. It's kind of up and coming trend. So I'm not quite ready to put it in a bottle and put it on the shelf. <laughs> But I thought home chefs could try it and we can play around. And if people like it, eventually, I do think that crickets will be hitting the market sooner or later. They're already on the shelf. There's cricket chips and a cricket bar. It's really good, actually. <laughs> so you have a lot of callings. You run a company, your mom, your daughter, your wife, you as well as a film producer. Now you're a book publisher and author. What is next for Julie Smolensky? Um, you know, right now I'm, I'm really just focused on enjoying all of the things that we've done and all the work that I've created and living in this moment. So I don't want to think too far ahead. Um, I, I think right now I just want to enjoy this moment. This is like very special. You don't get to write a book all the time. Uh, I'm going to just work on this for a while, going out, telling the story, talking to people. Um, sharing, you know, the, the food, sharing the book. Um, you know, for us at Lifeway, we've launched a couple new products. I'm super, super excited about one that's called Plantiful. It's a pea-based uh, pea milk, like non-dairy, because there's a, a trend in non-dairy food right now 
So we ha our customers are asking us to produce a non-dairy alternative. So we are. So I'm very, very excited about that. It has the potential to be as big as you know our, our main product, actually. Um, I am, uh, other than that, I mean, my goal is to heal as many people. You know, the product, our, our product is very healing in every which way. Um, and so it's important to me to get it into the hands of as many people, get the information out about the health benefits so that as many people are empowered to, you know, make healthier food choices and, and truly like heal their own bodies, their, their families, their communities. and. Um, if I can do that, then I think, um, you know, it's good. It's a good way to spend some time in life. And I think I'm just, I would like to just keep doing this work, but more, you know, greater, it's more impactful. Um, and then um, probably, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Fall in love. I don't know. <laughs> Another marathon in the making? ran the Berlin Marathon in September. It was awesome. It was so fun. It was, I did it over, um, it was Rosh Hashanah? I think it was Rosh Hashanah. Um, and it was really, really powerful because I felt here I was in the city over the Jewish holidays running 26 miles. And it was actually easy because I thought, this is the city where 6 million Jews had their death warrant written. And uh, it seemed easy to run 26 miles on their behalf. I wasn't on their behalf, I was running for mothers, but uh, it became easy because I felt my body being carried by their souls. I felt myself glide across the streets of Berlin. Um, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, and um, it was a very powerful experience. I thought I was running very fast, and I, when I passed by the crowd, the, the team that, you know, our supporters, um, I'm like, I'm running so fast, and they're looking at me like, you're the last one <laughs> on the team. I mean, not the last one in the marathon, but, and, uh, but I, it was great. I was very, very happy. So I loved the story about the sausage in the back of the trunk, and we're just wondering of the recipes, the one story that maybe really ties you to the memory of your parents and immigrating to the U.S.? There's not one because there's a few of them that do that have that, but there's a few that I'll, I'll just pull out that, that really come up for me. Um, one is the Here Comes the Sun breakfast bowl, and it was inspired by um, uh, my love for rock and roll, but my love for rock and roll came from my father's love for it. Um, and he was uh, something that inspired him to leave the Soviet Union at the time he did was when he got his hands on black market uh, Beatles and Led Zeppelin albums. And th at that time, if you were caught with those albums, you could have been arrested. They were censored, prohibited items. It, he got them through the black market, he listened to it, and he fell in love. He got so angry that just because of listening to this music that it, he could be arrested. And these were these things that really got him angry about life in the Soviet Union. And he was able to wire, Voice of America was here, or maybe is still here. He was, uh, you know, he was an engineer, so he wired a radio to pick up Voice of America that was being blocked by the Soviet Union. So they were jamming it. He was able to cut through it. Again, another thing that he could have been arrested for. He was trying to understand what life outside of the wall would be like. What was life in America? He didn't know because everything was propaganda that he heard. So he was getting this Voice of America. Anyway, so there's a breakfast bowl inspired by the Beatles called Here Comes the Sun. I talk about it. It's in the book. Um, another one was the Nutella smoothie and the Nutella ice pops in there, banana popsicles. And that's from the fact that when we were in exile in, in Italy, we were in Rome for three months. Probably many of our families went that journey, that route. We were one of the first. It was the first time my mom tried Nutella. And my mom fell in love with Nutella. And when we came to America, you know, two years after settling, she opened her store, her deli, Globus, because she said she recognized that all of these other Russian immigrants were going to be coming through and coming and settling into Chicago. And the first place you go for is your food. And she recognized that while she grew up in scarcity and there wasn't a lot of food in Russia and there wasn't variety, but whatever there was, she was, you know, used to this Eastern style of, of food and culinary 
experience and that didn't exist here. So she said, I'm going to open a store and everyone's going to come into the store to get their food. And she was, I mean, it's so brilliant. It's so intuitive for a woman to realize that, you know, we, we show our love through food usually. Uh, that's how we, we, we feed our families, we feed our communities. Um, it's, it's an intuition that we have to want to share that. So for her, you know, while, while, you know, a kitchen or food in some ways could be a, a form of gender oppression, you know, for her it became an empowerment and a, a way to be independent and, and have financial freedom and, and feed her family. So one of the first deals that she ever did, she said, Nutella was amazing and I'm going to import Nutella because everyone, all the Russians are going to try Nutella. They're already going to know it and they're going to want it when they come here. So she made the first, interna she was like 28 years old. She went, flew to Italy to make the first deal to bring Nutella over. She brought the first cases of Nutella into the United States. They were sold in Devon. I used to go to school with Nutella sandwiches and the kids would make fun of me. I was so ahead of the game. I mean, now it's like the hottest thing, right? Everyone loves Nutella. It blocks around the line on Michigan Avenue. So I, I, in this, the Nutella was very inspirational to me too. And I'm really impressed with my mother that she had the foresight to recognize this market opportunity. I, I don't want to say exploit it, but you know, she took advantage of it and uh, started a trend. <laughs> yeah. And as a an daughter of um, immigrants from the Soviet Union, successful women. Uh, what what would you advise to uh, immigrants from post-Soviet uh, countries who arrived uh, like in five years ago in the United States or currently? Um, what would be your advice in terms of uh, if you can categorize strangers, uh, strange um, strengths uh, in the uh, skills, abilities, and what would you advise to improve being in the United States? I mean, one of the great skill sets of immigrants is the fact that they're very hardworking. You know, immigrants, uh, you don't come here because you want, you want an easy life. <laughs> you know, people think America's paved with gold, that the streets are paved with gold, but that comes with a lot of work. Uh, our success has not been easy and it has not been luck. And, you know, it looks like it, but outside of it, there's a lot of hard work behind what looks like luck. Um, the work ethic that I had inherited from my parents is something that's, you know, very um, uh, important and critical to our success. Um, and that looks different in different ways. You know, work looks it's very different today than what it was before. You know, I'm not driving to pick up sausages or deliver kefir like my parents did, but I work in different ways. Um, also, immigrants have a very resilient can-do attitude. You know, to be a, an immigrant, you have to have strength and uh, the ability to sort of uh, almost have street smarts, like to know how to navigate very uncertain uh, unstable moments in life. Um, that's a skill set that my parents were able to uh, harness. Um, the ability to uh, kind of keep keeping your head up even in very difficult times. Um, some people can crumble under pressure. You know, my parents never, never crumbled. Um, I, I never did. Um, Let's see what else. Oh, the ability, um, like kind of um, community building. Um, one thing my parents really recognized was the power and importance of building community around them. Um, I think immigrants are really good in having that natural community. There's sort of a sense of closeness, of familiarity, of uh, sameness. You know, I, I, I immediately feel closer when I realize that I'm speaking to another fellow immigrant and even closer if it's a like a Russian immigrant you know I, I feel close with with many people I very very much um, uh, feel um, a, a, a closeness with people who've gone through struggles um, I, I see myself in it I see my own family in it and so I think that's another skill set that immigrants have um, 
you know, our bravery and courage that we we have is something that I think is is a very strong skill set. I think every time an immigrant opens their mouth, they're showing their bravery. You know, every time my mother speaks English with her strong accent, with the person who's on the receiving and looking at her confused and maybe not sure, uh, she shows that she's brave, that she can handle it, that she is okay to continue to speak and, and talk and expose herself. Uh, it's a vulnerability that's very beautiful, that's very strong. Um, uh, so those are some of the ones that come to mind. And then in terms of the, the uh, what, I, what, I, what I would have really would like our immigrant community to do is to be a little bit more thoughtful with the news that they share, the content that they share, where they pick up their news sources, um, I, I think that my biggest disappointment in the last few years has been with the kind of media that our immigrants are con consuming, the fact that they're being exploited by a lot of the media that they're con being consum consuming, and the fact that there's, um, uh, I guess, fake news is what I'm referring to, and the fact that they are sharing it without any thought of where it's coming from, there's no diligence around it, and somebody can just, you know, open up an internet site, make it look like it's news, and then some un, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a grandmother, an elderly grandmother who doesn't know, and she thinks it's oh, it's on the internet. You know, when I ask elderly people why did why are you doing this or why do you think this or whatever, I saw it on the internet. I mean, I, I, it's just, uh, and, and very important decisions about our world are being made based on this. And so I think I would say to the, to the new people coming is to say, is, is to be thoughtful about this. Yeah, you're welcome. I want to ask you about uh, <clears throat> the music in your life. And in particular, anything inspiration from the music, from especially Western music, uh, to do your uh, cooking stuff, your recipes, and so, for example, I know right now a lot of musicians are trying to uh, write the cookbooks. And uh, is there anything in your cookbooks which is inspired by music? Yeah, actually, I'm so excited about this question because it's my favorite. I could talk about this the whole day. Uh, this is actually my favorite part. Um, yeah, I love music. I'm a huge junkie. Um, there's a few recipes that are inspired. So my favorite band is Pearl Jam. So I, you know, pretty pretty strong rock and roll band. Um, I've gone to like over 45 shows around the world. I, it's not that I just even go to a show, but I want to travel around the world to see them in all different concert venues. I've made it like a bucket list to go to as many shows as I can around the world. So I've seen them in Mexico City and Amsterdam and many states around our country, um, you know, London and all over. Uh, so there's a panna cotta recipe that's inspired by them because, uh, so the lead musician there is Eddie Vedder, and when he goes on stage, he takes a bottle of wine, red wine with him every time, sometimes two, takes a bottle of red wine with him and his notebook, <laughs> and so uh, there's a song, Crazy Mary, so I have Mary's panna cotta, and the song goes, you know, take a bottle, drink it down. And um, he'll sometimes, when he sings a song, he'll drink from the bottle. Then he'll go down to the audience and pass the bottle around. So I uh, took red wine, cooked the sauce down. It's a red wine sauce that is then layered over the kefir. And um, it's delicious. Um, there's also Purple Haze, a smoothie that was inspired by Jimi Hendrix and, uh, you know, that song. Um, and then the fields of Provence. I kind of combined a uh, trip to Provence and visiting the lavender fields with the feeling of like lavender kind of is a herb plant that relaxes you and it sort of reminded me of how Jimi Hendrix kind of used drugs and it relaxed him. And so I kind of combined these two ideas of that to relax, you know, the relaxing of lavender, music, whatever his drug, you know, and so I made that recipe. Um, there's another recipe. There's one that I just refer to a line in a song. The uh, strawberry hibiscus pie is so good. It's um, delicious. And in the line, so it's all red, and, and I, uh, there's a little mint um, leaf on top of the sauce. And it's uh, a line in the, in the story that says, this treat will 
have you um, repeating this crimson and clover for the song uh, treat every you know over and over You'll, crimson and clover over and over so I use that line in the in the book and then there's a secret Spotify playlist with a handful of those recipes so the one actually the baba ganoush that I mentioned there's a playlist that is all of, it's got like Madonna in it during her Kabbalah time uh, there's you know some chanting it, it's it's a beautiful playlist I haven't published it yet but uh, there's a, a handful of playlists associated. The first one that I put out was the Truffle Polenta. So it's got like 80 songs in it, and it's to inspire uh, an evening with your lover or yourself. <laughs> um, quick question. Uh, family time, do you pass on the tradition cooking with your children? Do you pass on the stories? Um, do they go to the grandma's house and they cook grandma's borscht and all that stuff? Yeah, they, they love cooking. We've been cooking together since they were little. Um, there's a handful of uh, photos of them chopping peaches for, for jam. Um, they love to cook. They love to bake. They are now at the point where they're creating their own recipes. Um, they video their recipes, and they have a YouTube channel, so they are putting these recipes up on YouTube. <laughs> and they're teaching kids to cook with kefir, um, so they're already in the business um, working on it, being little ambassadors. Uh, yeah, they they uh, love to cook, and actually, the deconstructed it's a red velvet it's a not so red velvet cake in the book. It's deconstructed and broken, and it was inspired by them because you know it always tried to be like perfect, like perfect CEO, perfect mother. And so I realized there's no way to do, but you can't be perfect in everything you do, and sometimes it's okay to just not be perfect. And yeah, every time I had ever made a cake, we make cakes together all the time. And they would always stick their hands in the cake, of course, after I frost it, make it perfect. And then they stuck their fingers in it. And I was like so mad. And then I stopped trying to make it perfect anymore. And we just broke it up and made it deconstructed. And I said, you know, it's actually beautiful. The brokenness of it, the imperfections become even more beautiful. And it was inspired by them um, and recognizing that there's no way to be actually per a perfect mother or a perfect parent or a perfect anything. Uh, so, yeah, but they love cooking, I'm sure. And it's a, I think it's really important that we cook together. I really wanted to share that piece of it that, you know, when you come together and you cook a meal together and you eat it and you're thoughtful about it, that you're not just shoving food in your face, that you're actually having an experience. Uh, that's really important. I think that's one of the problems that we're so used to just eating to, you know, feed our feed our mind, you know, feed and escape, and like we're not even conscious of what we're putting in our mouth in our bodies. Um, when you sit and cook and and cook in a way that it's not a burden, that it's not like, oh, I gotta cook dinner. When I cook, it's an, it's a pleasurable experience for me. Uh, I take time, I put music on, I pour a glass of wine, I put a candle on. I want it to be something that I'm enjoying if I'm doing it. It doesn't feel like it's a chore or housework. It's a, a beautiful experience. And if we can do it together and then share a meal and have a conversation, now we've had a very meaningful experience. And it's, that's why the stories are there, because I, I have those, those moments. So, yeah. What's your advice to parents of raising strong girls, strong daughters to become strong women, because I think, I don't know about others, in a, especially in the Russian community, there's still tons of stereotypes about, oh, don't be a girl, saying to boys, and there are tons of gender stereotypes, and I want, you know, besides leading by example, what else, how else you inspire your kids, or what do you do for your girls to feel strong, be strong, and be successful and feel empowered being a woman? Yeah, that's a great question because I think about it all the time. I mean, for sure I was going to say, you said besides, but I think, of course, being a role model for them is the number one. They see it, then they see you doing it, so it's easier for them to do it. But also I think, and something that my parents did for me, that I, I'm, you know, there were a lot of things my dad did wrong, but there were some things my dad did right. And one thing he did right was always putting female role models in front of me, strong female role models. Um, even though at the time when I was growing up, there weren't that many. Now there's a lot. I mean, it's still. I mean, we can do better. Obviously, we're still nowhere near gender parity. But at the time, there was even less. There was like five. 
five strong women that he could find, and he put them all in front of me. He said, Julie, I want you to be like them. So Christy Hefner, for example, uh, she took over for her father's Playboy, you know, his, Q Hefner. She took over for, for Hugh. And she was a young woman, too. And I remember coming home from college. I was 18, 19. I came in. Today. CNN had a special about Christy. And my dad said, Julie, come here. I said, what? Look at, look at Christy. I want you to be like her. Look at, she took over her father's company, and I want you to be just like her. And if he hadn't said that to me, I might not have had the kind of thought process that when the time came that I could do it. It was sort of like he already, he gave me the approval to like, go do that. Here's the path. Here's what it looks like. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And that's one of the problems for girls is that there aren't enough examples of these positions. You know, it's, it's one reason that like Hillary didn't win because we've never seen a woman run for office. We don't know what that looks like. We've never seen a woman be the chief commander in chief. We don't know what that looks like. We are not sure of that. So really this idea of like breaking the glass ceiling to continue to trailblaze a path for other girls to you know go into these positions of, of power but also uh, it's important for boys to see it too because boys have their beliefs about what gender roles are like and if boys can't see strong powerful women then they won't kind of embrace it they won't they won't take it they won't accept it for their own lives for their partners so when boys see that their female uh, co you know students are have equal uh, say that they're 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 you know worthy that their thoughts are important. When boys see that, then that will help you know girls and in, in lead and go forward as well. So those are some things. And then there's other little things like challenging them to um, embrace uh, uh, like fearlessness and usually through athletics or doing kind of brave acts of bravery. So. Um, to, to show them that they can overcome their fears. For example, we went zip lining. Um, you know, actually, this is one that my littlest one wanted to do. I was like the one that was afraid, but I saw that she was fearless, and I was like, I, I can't actually show that I'm scared to do this. I have to do it because she's going to think I'm a wimp. So I got to go and do it. But you know, it's it's this it, this idea of like when you when you do something you're afraid of, then you felt the feeling and you know you can get through it. So then you can challenge yourself to do it in other ways. Um, you know, I make them, for example, they, they did a 5K with me. They're like, we don't know if we can do it. I don't know. We're tired. We're this, we're that. The 5K is so much. It's three miles. I said, you can do it. It's a, it's a challenge, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it together. And having them go through that process, it empowered them. It showed them that they have strength, that they, they can push themselves, that they can overcome their fears and overcome their challenges. It's these small little ways that you can test yourself and, and encourage that. Um, I encourage them to speak up, to give speeches, to give toasts. Anytime when uh, there's a family birthday, I say, give a toast. You know, have, know what it feels like to get up on a stage, to have a microphone, to share your thoughts, to share your opinions. One of the biggest fears that all people have is actually public speaking. And it's one of the biggest skill sets. It's actually a huge asset. And if you can get past that fear, you actually can share your, your life, your voice. It's very, very powerful. And so to test, to, to give them opportunities to test where they are strong is really important. Those are some of the things that come to mind. <laughs> Another challenge that was in front of you was writing a book. And I think you accomplished it with this. So thank you very much, everyone, for gathering with us this evening. Thank you very much, Julie, and the whole Lifeway crew. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you.